Good morning again, this is Jonathan Small. I am the host of a revamp edition of All About You, which is All About You was a pretty much a biographical style talk show from 2012 to 2017 at accesstv.org studios. And basically this is a revamp edition at Wynn Studios. And this morning we have a guest who actually is a returning guest to accesstv.org network studios. And I have the pleasure of having him back on Wynn Studios to discuss his life and career and many different uh, ventures that he is pretty much has experienced towards his background, his culture, and it's, he just a, a, I guess he's an amazing type of person with his wisdom on the reggae and Jamaican culture in particular. The guest this morning on All About You is no other than actor, producer, uh, former DJ, lecturer, uh, Jamaican reggae culture expert, Roger Steffens. Good morning, Roger. How are you doing? I'm all right. It's a it's, um, very interesting morning here in Los Angeles. As I look out toward the west, the, the sky is a very, very deep uh, gray-blue color that I, I haven't seen in a long time. It almost uh, looks like it might rain today, which would be a blessing. Now, are you in Southern California, or are you up by the oh, bay? Oh, I'm, I'm way in Southern California, yeah. I'm in the heart of Los Angeles. Uh, I'm a Brooklyn boy, by the way. I was born in Brooklyn in 1942, and I'm still angry at Walter O'Malley for moving the Dodgers, but I live right over the hill from Dodger Stadium, so I'm a real hypocrite. <laughs> well, Roger, that's a good uh, starting point to discuss your background in your life. Um, obviously, you was born and raised in New York, Brooklyn, uh, New York. What was it what like? Was it like? And then Jersey. I lived in Brooklyn till I was nine, and then we went across the bridge to uh, New Jersey, where my father's family had lived for about 250 years. Okay, well, Roger, first of all, what was it like growing up in Brooklyn, New York, up until nine years old of age? Oh, it, it was a lot of fun. You know, uh, we, we'd get an occasional hurricane, which uh, livened things up, and uh, we'd get snow in the winter, and we'd pull out our sleds and go uh, sledding in the backyard of uh, a house next to our apartment building, and I would collect baseball cards and um i i was always interested in 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 writing and i got a a typewriter when i was like six years old and it had a it was kind of like a toy typewriter and you had a dial that you would turn to the letter and then you could press a key and then you'd turn the dial to the next letter and i used to make little neighborhood newspapers up and sell them for a nickel so I, I guess I always had that, that writer's bug, but also acting. My, my mother was uh, crazy about the theater and um, she would uh, bring us out to Lake Hopatcong in New Jersey every summer to a little cabin we had out there. And my dad would come out on the weekends and uh, my mother would get all the little kids together and dress us in uh, paper mache costumes and we would do um, Romeo and Juliet, and we would do uh, uh, knights in armor and uh, make up little plays for the for the fathers when they came up on the weekends. And so I always had uh, theater in my blood as well. And uh, I guess that's why my primary occupations have been uh, writing and acting. Mm -hmm. Well, Roger, you mentioned earlier about baseball cards, and obviously Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Dodgers was well known. Uh, Jackie Robinson, I'm just curious to know, were you a Brooklyn Dodgers or a baseball fan growing up in oh, Brooklyn, New York? Dodger yeah. fan, Dodger fan like crazy. Yeah, my, my dad had played um, semi-pro baseball as a catcher in a Yankee farm team, and um, he, he taught me all the rules of baseball and we used to play catch together and I never had any great sports talent and I'm glad he, he didn't force it on me but uh, um, we we rooted for different teams my dad was the Yankee fan but he said the best catcher in baseball was uh, uh, Roy Campanella the Dodger catcher 
-hmm. and that that was my dad's position so he 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 knew uh, why exactly Campanella could run a game better than anybody in baseball and we all cried when when he got shot and that was a terrible day in my childhood I didn't know that though you're saying Roy Campanella got shot is yeah, he owned said? a liquor store, I think, up in Harlem, and he got robbed and shot, and that was the end of his career, and he died not long after. Wasn't he paralyzed, though, like from the waist down? Uh, yeah, he was paralyzed after he got shot. You know, I never realized exactly why he was paralyzed. I thought he was involved in a car accident. I didn't realize that he got shot, and that's what caused him to be uh, paralyzed. Yeah, yeah it's terrible. Did that happen kind of at the prime or peak of his career? Uh, can you remember? Yeah. That? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, now, Jackie Robinson, what was your take on Jackie Robinson playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers? Oh, he, he was brilliant. I have his baseball card. I've got Sandy Koufax's rookie card. I've got Tommy Lasorda's card for the one season he was a Dodger. Yeah, I still uh -huh. have all those cards. Now I would assume uh, I in the back room and get him if you want to see him. <laughs> okay, uh, Roger. I would assume the stadium where the Brooklyn Dodgers played at no longer exists at this. No, Ebbets Field. It's a housing development now. Okay. Now again, you mentioned you would go and live in New Jersey at the age of nine. Which part? Uh, which part of uh, New Jersey did you reside at when you moved to um, New Jersey? Well, the, the summertime we were in Lake Hopatcong, and then we m moved to a little town called New Milford, and then uh, to Westwood, where my dad had gone to high school. He he built a house there, and uh, that that was a whole different lifestyle, and it was very safe. Um, my mother would let me ride my bike for miles and miles away, and not worry about me, and. We'd get on the, the bus and go to Hackensack to the YMCA and swim in the pool there. And, um, you know, there, there wasn't any idea that you could be kidnapped or something terrible would happen to you. Even, even when I was 10 years of age, I, I, I could uh, get on my bike and have the freedom to explore woods nearby or visit a friend who lived three miles away. It was, it was a, a, a wonderful childhood. I, I, I have no problems looking back at, uh, at my childhood. It, it, was, it was blessed, especially when I, when I see the world today, you know. Mm -hmm. you, you wouldn't let a 9 or 10-year-old kid just go off on their own and go miles and miles away. You'd have a lot of worries, I think, these days. Now, after... Yes. Now, Roger, after high school, um, where did you go? Did you stay in um, New Jersey after um, high school? Or did you Let's go some... talk a little bit about high school. Okay. Um, I, I, went, I had 15 years of Catholic education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, my high school, Bergen Catholic, had just started. And they, uh, it was a, a quadrangle. And each year they would add a, another side to the quadrangle. So I was in their first graduating class in 1960. And one day when I was a sophomore, I was standing on a pile of dirt next to the excavation for the new gymnasium. And I was yelling at something. And an old Irish Christian brother came up to me uh, named Brother Bradley. And he says, hey, you, hey, come down from there. <laughs> and I said, it's OK for me to be up here, brother. No, no, no. He says, I want you. I want you for my public speaking club. Right. Right. And I said, I, I didn't know we have one, brother. He says, we do now. You're it. So he, he saw something in me when I was like 15 years old. And he became my, my coach, my, my teacher. And we entered lots of different uh, oratory contests. And I lost every time. And in my senior year, uh, he said, we're going to go for the big one. Uh, at that time, uh, the, the the biggest oratory contest in America was run by the American Legion, and the topic was the Constitution. And you had to write and memorize a 12-minute speech, and you had to be prepared to speak for six minutes on 12 different amendments. And you didn't know until you got to the contest which amendment would, it would be. They'd pull it out of a hat. So I wrote, let's see, 12 and, and uh, 
I, I, I wrote speeches for all of those amendments and memorized them and a 12 minute speech. And I was the New Jersey State Oratory Champion. And I won a scholarship to Rutgers and the uh, Irish Christian brothers didn't want me to go to a non-Catholic school. So they, um, they gave me a scholarship to Iona for drama. Mm -hmm. and, um, I went there for about two and a half years and then I went to drama school. I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York and then the, the army came after me in 65. So I, I uh, went to Carnegie Tech, uh, the oldest drama school in America, uh, out at uh, what became Carnegie Mellon University. And I was in, in school with a lot of people who became pretty well known later, Steve Bochco and Robert Foxworth and uh, others who, who had really uh, long careers in television. And um, uh, I worked for a year at the New York Times. Uh, and um, then I, I, in 1960, 65, I was invited to join the Milwaukee Repertory Theater as a member of the resident company. And I was making $42.50 a week, mm -hmm. and I had never been happier in my life. I was getting paid to act. Right. right. And uh, in, on Valentine's Day in 66, there was a wonderful black woman who was a teacher in a local high school in Milwaukee. Uh, she was a rather large woman, and her name was Joanna Featherstone. And she heard me warming up my voice uh in the dressing room one bitter cold night in milwaukee uh reading e. e cummings poetry and she says you know i teach english she says and tomorrow is valentine's day would you come to my 8 30 speaking of 8 30 in the morning would you come to my 8 30 english class and read poetry to my kids and I said, no, they'll kill me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and because so, and at that point I had a red beard and, uh, you know, I, I looked like a hippie in the early days of hippie. And I, I and this was mainly a black high school. Uh -huh. So I, I, yeah, OK, I'll do it. And um, I, I, I did a, a kind of Lord Buckley-esque uh, talk on uh, on Shakespeare and uh, did the uh, dagger speech from Macbeth. Is this a dagger I see before me? It's handled toward my hand. Come, let me clutch thee. I have thee not, mm -hmm. and yet I see thee still. Art thou not fatal vision, sensible to feeling as to touch? Or art thou but a dagger of the mind? Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I don't know why I remember that 50 years later, but I do. And it went over so well, she asked me to stay for the second period and do it all over again. And by the third period, I was in the gym with 400 kids. And the Milwaukee Journal heard about this, and they did an article called uh, Young Actor is Hip on Macbeth Makes Teens Dig Shakespeare. Uh -huh. And I started getting requests from all around uh, that area of the Midwest, Milwaukee, Chicago, Racine. And... Uh, Suddenly, I was working uh, as a, a one-man show actor, uh, uh, poetry for people who hate poetry. Right. And I, I did that in a couple of hundred schools for the next two years, uh, all over the Midwest, primarily. And then I got drafted. Mm -hmm. I got drafted when I was an actor in residence at a Catholic woman's college in St. Louis, me and 750 Catholic girls living on campus. <laughs> it was as close to heaven as I've been. Uh -huh. And on the opening night of the play I was doing with them, um, I got my draft notice. So I went to the local recruiter in St. Louis, where the school was, and uh, he said, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm an actor. I'm a broadcaster. I started my broadcast career in 1961 at WVOX up in New Rochelle. Uh, with the Iona College Magazine of the Air. And my very first guest was Ola Tunji, the great Nigerian drummer. Mm -hmm. I had that album called Drums of Passion. And um, I, I did that for almost two years. So I have radio in my background, and of course, theater acting. And, um, they, and so the recruiter said, well, why don't you enlist for an extra year and we'll put you in the radio TV division? And... Uh, 
I thought about that for a while and I said, uh, well, it's better than going to Vietnam. And he said, yeah, we don't have any stations in Vietnam. He didn't tell me they were building nine. Uh -huh. And so I enlisted for the extra year and uh, did my basic training in Fort Leonard Wood in, in Missouri. <laughs> and the first day, the drill sergeant puts us all together in a platoon and um, he says, uh, all right, troops, listen up. Last week we had a tornado here on the base. And if a tornado lifts you up and throws you in the air, you'd best land in platoon formation. Is that understood? Yeah. <laughs> yes, Sergeant. <laughs> so I, I had basic training there and then well, all set to go to the radio television school for my advanced training. And uh -huh. instead they sent me to a fort in Indianapolis to become a stenographer. Right. right. And I said, you promised me. Oh, you're you're in the army now. We can do whatever we want with you, Drew. Roger, um, I know obviously the Vietnam era can be a very um, scary time you know, for people who are not aware of what it was like in the Vietnam era. Uh, a lot of um, controversy of the fact that the United States was even involved in the um, Vietnam War, protestings. There was this song, I believe, called War. Uh, I forgot the group that actually, or the solo. War, what is it good for? Was it Barrett Strong? Motown, Barrett Motown. Strong. Right, absolutely nothing. One of the most popular songs back in the day. And, you know, obviously you was able to, at some point, um, be released from Vietnam War. Cause I guess, I guess you didn't spend a long time in the Vietnam era, or did you? Oh, my God, Jonathan. Uh -huh. I spent 25 months at the height of the war. Uh -huh. What happened was uh, when I got off to that little fort to be a stenographer, it was the same little fort where the de defense information radio TV school that I should have been sent to mm -hmm. was located. Mm -hmm. So a kindly master sergeant got me transferred into radio TV. And that was the best school I've ever been to in my life. Uh, the, the training was incredible, and it had the extra frisson of uh, at the end of each week, um, if you didn't pass the tests, you were sent back to your regular unit and shipped off to Vietnam. So there was a powerful incentive to do really well in the school. And each week we learned a different position in a radio and TV studio. One week we were directors, next week we were cameramen, next week we were the writers, next week we were talent uh, and, and so forth. I mean, next week we were a lighting director. And um, I, I ended up the honor graduate. And um, my first, this is interesting because of my uh, my work throughout my past 50 years with reggae music. Mm -hmm. My first assignment was to run um, a, a radio TV station in Asmara, Eritrea, the province in Ethiopia that was in constant revolt against Haile Selassie's government. And I had my shots and my visa. I was all set to go. And the last week of class, they canceled everyone's orders and shipped us off to Fort Bragg, North Carolina to the Green Berets at the JFK Special Warfare Center for PSYOPs, Psychological Operations, Propaganda Warfare. And we had three weeks of indoctrination. And you know how they trained us? With Nazi films. Nazi films, Nazi films. Yeah. yeah. Nazi films. You know, the Triumph of the Will film, the Nazi Nuremberg rally film. Uh -huh. There's a four hour version of that film by Lenny Reifenstahl. And that was our first class. And three weeks later, it was our final class. They repeated the whole four-hour Nazi film and said, this is the best propaganda ever made. Go to Vietnam now and uh, use that as your inspiration. And um, we were sent there to carry 80 pounds of loudspeaker backpacks into frontline combat operations, broadcasting pre-recorded surrender messages to the Viet Cong. And that's what I shipped off to Nam, thinking was going to happen to me. And I was scared to death. This was the first week of November in 1967. But let me lighten the story up a little bit and talk about my final day in America. 
uh, we were at the San Fran, uh, the Oakland Army base to ship out, and at night uh, we, we could go off base. And uh, my last night in in, in uh, San Francisco, we went to the Fillmore, um, and there was a British band going to make its debut, and the opening act was Janis Joplin and Big Brother. And I had seen all of Alan Freed's big reviews in, in Brooklyn and New York Paramount back in the 50s and seen most of the major figures in, in early rock and roll. And I'd never seen anything that I could compare to Janice except maybe Jackie Wilson. And she was like an exposed nerve ending with a voice. And she did the most incredible set of music. And then Richie Havens came out and sat in the middle of the dance floor with a circle of about 2,000 kids around him, just him and his acoustic guitar mesmerizing us for almost an hour. And then Bill Graham, the producer, promoter, came out on stage and said, I know you paid $3 to see three acts tonight, mm -hmm. but Pink Floyd can't get out of customs in time. I'm so sorry. So I went to the Hungry Eye and I got the band there to come and sit in for them. Please welcome Ike and Tina Turner. Oh, wow. And Janice comes racing out of her dressing room with a full bottle of Southern Comfort and stands in front of the stage right below Jan uh, 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 Tina for her entire set, all wowing and, and killing the bottle. Oh. And at the end of Tina's set, Janice decided to do an unannounced second set of music and Jonathan, that Bob, my hero, Marley, notwithstanding, that was the greatest set of music I've ever seen in my my entire life. It was just phenomenal. And the next morning, I flew to Vietnam. Uh -huh. And um, they sent in Saigon, the group headquarters for Psyops, uh, looked at your records and and uh, decided where to place you and i i was fully expecting to be sent into a combat operation and scared to death and they looked at my typing speed and my iq and they said the colonel's typist is going home next week would you like to live in the air-conditioned hotel across the street or would you like to go out with the ninth division into combat so you can imagine what, what my choice was. Right. And I decided to stay in Saigon, which was pretty cushy. We could wear civilian clothes when we were off duty. Uh, the, the city seemed fairly safe, but there were people like Saigon Sally riding around on the back of a motorcycle, tossing grenades into sidewalk cafes. There was no front line in the Vietnam War. It was urban warfare. We were being shelled at night. Um, eventually, my entire block was burned to the ground when when three rockets hit us on Ho Chi Minh's birthday in the mini offensive in May of 1968. Uh -huh. I was in Saigon all during the Tet Offensive, and you know, all prepared to shoot somebody if they if I saw them coming at me. Thank God, in my whole 25 months in Vietnam, I never fired a shot. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. That's uh, there was a, a a terrible aftermath to the Tet Offensive. So many parts of the city had literally just been wiped out. Looked like the Gaza Strip out in Cholon, the Chinese section. And in front of my um, uh, my barracks, big hotel across from the Psyops headquarters, in an old rail yard, um, there were huge sewer pipes about six feet across that hadn't been laid underground yet. And there were 52 families living in those sewer pipes. And uh, uh, I, I'd go out in the morning to, to go to work and, and uh, there'd be corpses on the sidewalk from people who had starved to death. Uh -huh. So one of the places where I used to do my poetry shows uh, was a town called Racine, Wisconsin, about 20 miles south of Milwaukee on, on Lake Michigan. And I'd played in all the high schools and colleges there at least two or three times. I was kind of a, a local star in Racine, Wisconsin. And I wrote a letter to the editor of the Racine newspaper talking about the condition and asking my friends in Racine to send food and clothing that I could distribute personally to the, the, the refugees. And they published the letter along with an editorial urging the students who had remembered me to get together and, and, and 
form some committees to gather food and clothing. And three weeks later, two five-ton trucks pull into the compound in Saigon with my mail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I went into the colonel's office and I said, sir, there's something outside you, you've got to see. He said, I'm very busy, private. I said, no, sir, you, you have to come out and see this. All right. So he goes out and the mail clerk had opened one of these huge nine foot tall connexes, you know, those big steel shipping crates. Right. And right. all these little packages are falling out with stamps on them and all addressed to me. And he said, well, what the hell is that, Private? And I said, well, I, I'm pretty sure it's food and clothing that I asked my friends to send me. But I promised I would personally distribute it to the refugees um, so it doesn't end up on the black market. Come into my office, Stephens. And he promoted me to spec four, like corporal. And he gave me my own Quonset hut. And he told me I could go anywhere in Vietnam I wanted, from the DMZ to the Mekong Delta, and work on any project I thought worthwhile, as long as I took pictures. Mm -hmm. So that, that was the beginning of my photographic experiences. And I bought a... Uh, on my arrival, I bought a little Canon FT because uh, I realized I was in the midst of history and I started shooting. So um, at that point, um, we uh, we started building villages in the bombed out areas. Oh. Uh, the printing plant, uh, while I was in Vietnam, printed over one billion propaganda leaflets to drop from small planes over suspected enemy positions and the the big huge rolls of newsprint like you'd see in a newspaper publishing uh, uh, factory uh, came in these huge wooden crates and that wood was worth its weight in gold in vietnam uh -huh. and i arranged for the empty crates to be given to the buddhist social center and i did an enormous amount of work with them all over the country with uh, Thich Nhat Tien, the head of the Buddhist Social Center. We, and we went to Hue, which is the place that Full Metal Jacket, the movie was made about. Hue was 90% 90, 90 of the, the city of Hue was, was destroyed in the Tet Offensive. So I, I went up there and, and helped build uh, homes and went up to the DMZ as soon as the Tet Offensive ended and worked with the uh, some Catholic nuns who were living in a trailer and uh, helped out with refugees on the DMZ. And uh, the, the most incredible place in my entire 25 months in Vietnam was the island of the coconut monk. Mm. And it's amazing there's not much published about that at all because there was no other place on earth I can compare it to. In the middle of the Mekong River, about 80 miles south of Saigon, was uh, about a mile long sandbar. The South Bank was controlled by the communists, the North Bank by the Americans and the South Vietnamese Army. And they would fire rockets and mortars over the island, but never touch the island. The island was like a, a, a religious Disneyland run by a four and a half foot tall hunchback monk called the Coconut Monk, oh. who had been trained by the French colonial authorities in the 1930s in France as a chemical engineer. And they brought him back to Vietnam and they wanted him to become a colonial functionary. And he refused and uh, he ended up leaving his family and uh, donning the robes of a Buddhist monk. Roger, Roger, excuse me. I, yeah, Roger, I, I don't mean to um, interrupt you, but we're kind of running out of time. And I definitely don't want to leave out the Jamaican yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I hate to end it on that note, but I, I've, but I definitely want to get into, and let's kind of get like a quick and quick a quick question and answer segment. But actually, we're down to five minutes, believe it or not. So we really don't have enough time to really go in depth. Eighty years, yeah. But I mean, obviously, this morning we we was able to, to allow people to get another side and experience of your life and your background because many people in this generation most likely recognize you towards your Jamaican reggae uh, DJ experience, your culture, your trips down there on many different times. And there's another side of your life that you was able to elaborate this morning that I didn't really know. And I believe many people in the younger generation really didn't know. 
and I think that was real interesting as well. And I don't want to really start the topic about your trip to Jamaica. We just don't have enough time. So we could always, have, I guess, at some point bring you back for a part two and go to the next level of your first experience going to Kingston, Jamaica, and what you had experienced. But um, briefly, could you kind of let people know a little bit about your first trip to Jamaica just as we close up this particular segment, if you can do it briefly? Well, I, I discovered reggae in 73 from a wonderful article in Rolling Stone. The writer said, reggae music crawls into your bloodstream like some vampire amoeba from the psychic rapids of Upper Niger consciousness. Oh. And I said, I don't know what this is, but I got to find it. And I bought Catch a Fire, the first Whalers album, and saw The Harder They Come and My Life Changed Forever. But we, we couldn't find the music. The very few stores even carried a reggae album. So in 1976, my wife Mary and I went to uh, to uh, uh, Kingston, and we went to Bob Marley's Record Shack in the midst of the national state of emergency. And Kingston was empty, and everybody said, "Don't go; it's worth your life." But we had to. We went, wanted to get the music, uh -huh. and we went to Bob's Record Shack, and he had no. There were no Bob Marley records for sale, or <laughs> Bunny Whaler, and. Um, one of the biggest stars in reggae music at the time picked my pocket uh -huh. in Tough Gong in Bob Marley's record store. So that was my introduction to Kingston and the world of reggae. And a few minutes later, uh, somebody asked us if we would like to go to Jimmy's house. And we, we ended up in Jimmy Cliff's house with uh, him and, and Chinna Smith and uh, Joe Higgs and a whole bunch of uh, people who... I would would learn later were among the the greatest reggae musicians of all time, and they they opened their their arms to us and uh, were were just so friendly and counterbalanced the pickpocket. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that that was a, a, an eye opening experience in every every way. And in 1978, I met a guy named Hank Holmes in L.A. who had 8,000 Jamaican records and never left L.A. And we tried for a year to get on the air, and we finally got on a tiny station in a junior high school classroom with great plans to grow, an NPR affiliate called uh, KCRW. Oh. And uh, we we raised, when I was on the radio there, uh, over a million dollars oh. in the a annual fundraisers for that station. And they eventually were able to move into a bigger one. And just recently they moved into a $38 million station oh. in Santa Monica. But when we were there, it was a little tiny junior high school classroom with 110 watts. And it became, the reggae beat became the most popular non-commercial radio show in all of Southern California. And uh, my well, first well, guest was Bob Marley. Okay, well, Roger, let's end it on that note. I will definitely look into, in the future, bringing you back for a part two, just to talk about your reggae Jamaican um, experience. Talk and that, about my acting. Talk, talk about your acting. I mean, there's many things about your life and background that we still haven't really disclosed to the public. But I, again, I appreciate you being a guest on All About You this morning, particularly under short notice. And I definitely will keep in contact with you. And for people out there, I had enjoyed this interview with reggae expert, actor, producer, lecturer, no other than Roger Stephens.